today I'm going to uh, tell you a story about um, fractal, which is something that connects quantum hard drive to foliated manifold. So usually a science story goes like this, uh, that Newton is sitting under the apple tree. And then by thinking about why apple falls to the ground, he came up with the Newton's law and that's why we can send rockets to the moon. Uh, or Einstein was thinking about the weird question of how moving clock can go slower and that led to special relativity and that's why we can have super precise uh, GPS system nowadays. So uh, these stories are about how philosophical and conceptual development can lead to technological breakthroughs uh, that we all enjoy in our everyday life. Uh, but the story I'm going to tell you today is kind of a, a reverse story. It started by peeping, people asking a highly practical question. Uh, people were asking how to make a hard drive. Well, not any hard drive, but a hard drive that can be used uh, with quantum computers and to store quantum information. So this sounds like a question that's uh, for um, engineers. Uh, but it turns out to be a highly profound pursuit uh, that led people to do a bit of soul searching in terms of uh, our many convictions about what quantum systems can be like. So of course, quantum mechanics was discovered a um, hundred years ago. And um, during this hundred years, we have learned so much about all the weird stuff that quantum mechanics can do for us. And, but even until nowadays, a hundred years later, we're still constantly being surprised by quantum system. And one of the quantum systems that keeps surprising us is what is called strongly interacting quantum many body system. Meaning that uh, you have a quantum system and the system contains, uh, is a, a very big quantum system. And there are a lot of quantum mechanical components. It can be uh, electrons, atoms, um, photons, anything, anything that behaves quantum mechanically, and you put them together in large number, and by large number, I mean thousands, tens of thousands, or even millions, or even 10 to the 23rd. And when you put them together, imagining all these components to strongly interact uh, with each other. And from there, a lot of very weird phenomena uh, can show up. So this fracton is one of them. And that's what I want to tell you about today. So I'll tell you about how people in quantum information were thinking about this highly practical question of how to make a quantum hard drive, but it led to some surprising discoveries that inspired people in condensed matter and also in quantum field theory. So condensed matter is usually a subject where people study uh, materials. Um, what, what the properties of materials are. And quantum field theory, people use it to very successfully study, for example, uh, high energy particles, how they collide with each other. But it turns out that this topic of fracton brings all people in all these areas together and together we're exploring the endless possibilities of quantum mechanical system. So I'm going to tell you how we started from this picture of a hard drive and then go to this picture of a mountain with, with layers of deposits, and then to this picture of a dog made of other pictures. Okay, I know it doesn't make sense at all. Uh, so let's begin. Oops, sorry. Okay, good. Oops, sorry, okay, good. Uh, so one of the things uh, we have been very successfully doing in the past two or three decades is to put the word quantum in front of things. For example, we now have at least a notion of quantum computer and uh, some prototypes uh, in labs around the world. And associated with that, uh, we have quantum cryptography, quantum communication, quantum algorithm, quantum money, quantum internet, and even quantum AI. Um, but in spite of all of these developments, there's one special electric equipment that we find very hard to put the word quantum in front. And that turns out to be the hard drive. 
That is, even until nowadays, we don't even know, uh, we don't have a, a very well theoretic, theoretical proposal for how to make a quantum hard drive. Well, um, we all have hard drives. Everybody has hard drive. And, and to, to con contrast to a quantum hard drive, let's call it a classical hard drive. And we have classical hard drives so we can put files, pictures, music, and movies on it, right? And of course, fundamentally, what a classical hard drive is doing is to store classical bits, classical bits of zero and one, and lots of them. Um, and well, if we, we were storing it in the presence of error, something might happen to the hard disk. And we're storing it just in our drawer without doing anything to it, without actively running any algorithms on that. Uh, but we, we can safely store the information uh, with passive protection such that after a long time, after a very long time, let's say weeks or months or years, we can still safely retrieve the information once we plug the hard drive uh, back to a computer. And that's exactly what we want to do uh, with a quantum hard drive, except that now instead of storing classical bits, we want to store quantum bits. And quantum bits, or what we call qubits, um, is similar to a classical bits, except for that now we don't just have zero and one, but instead we can have an arbitrary superposition of the state of zero and one. So here alpha and beta are the superposition coefficients, and we want a quantum bits to be in any of these states, and we want the quantum hard drive to be able to store a bunch of quantum bits like this, and that's it. But other than that, um, our expectation for a quantum hard drive is totally similar to what we want from a classical hard drive. Uh, we want to store it in the presence of error. Of course, in quantum mechanics, it's more fragile, so the effect of error is maybe stronger, and we want to do it without the need of plugging the hard drive into a power source and run some algorithms on it. We want the system to passively protect the information that's stored. And hopefully, after a long time, we'll be able to retrieve the information reliably uh, from the hard drive. So to understand why it might be hard um, to have a quantum hard drive, uh, let's go back to think about how classical hard drive is working. Every one of us has a classical hard drive, and we know that the, well, at least the simplest version of a classical hard drive is a two-dimensional magnetic disk. I have a disk, uh, and, and there are, and it's a magnetic material, and information are stored in the magnetic domains. For example, we can have one domain where all the magnets are pointing up, and we can use it to represent zero, and we can have another domain where all the magnets are pointing down, and this is the domain that represents one. So uh, then if we want to flip a zero, <coughs> excuse me, flip a zero to a one, uh, we need to flip a lot of magnets in the domains. That takes a lot of effort, uh, but it's actually more than that. It, because if we think about how errors can happen and how errors can propagate, we'll see why two-dimensional magnets make a very good hard drive. That is, it can store information very reliably. And so let's just say we take uh, one of the domain where all the magnets are pointing up, representing a zero, and error happens. Error happens by randomly flipping one of the magnets from pointing up to pointing down. And when that happens, it actually creates four error, a set of four error, because this magnet will be anti-aligned with four nearest neighbors. And that's against the rule for ferromagnetism because ferromagnet prefers all the magnets to be pointing in the same direction. So flipping one of the magnets creates four errors. Okay. Uh, but that's okay. That's just one tiny bit error. And uh, But what, <clears throat> what can happen after that is that this uh, error domain can, can grow. And when that happens, for example, it expands from a single bit, single magnet being flipped to four of them being flipped, then the number of errors uh, actually increase 
because these four will have more neighboring pairs and all these eight neighboring pairs will now uh, have a higher energy and correspond to errors. So this is to be contrasted to a one dimensional magnet because if you think about it, we, we don't use one dimensional magnetic strip uh, to, to, to use as a hard drive. And um, it might sound silly, but we, we don't do that. And there's a very good reason why we don't do it. Because in one dimensional magnet, we can also, we can, we can still get a, a big domain um, to represent zero. We can say, okay, this is a large, a very long strip and all the magnets pointing up is zero and all the magnets pointing down is one. So it's still hard to flip all the, all the magnets. But if you think about how the process happens, it's very different from the two dimensional version because now if one of the magnets gets flipped, it creates two errors. Uh, but then if more magnets get flipped, there's still two errors because there's only two domain wall on the two sides of uh, the, the middle red region as compared to the rest of the system. Um, so in one dimension, as the error propagates, the number of domain walls remains constant. And correspondingly, um, the energy that's required in the whole process remains constant until eventually, of course, everything's flipped and we get a, a big error. So if we plot the energy scale in the process, we see that it starts from zero where everything's fine and it goes to two where we have two domain walls and it stays at two um, throughout the process until eventually it goes back down to zero, which means that once we have random fluctuation that generates a pair of domain wall. These domain walls are like point particles that's doing random work on one dimensional chain. And we know that when point things, point particles doing random work on one dimensional chain, it takes only uh, L squared time to flip the whole domain where L is the size of the domain. So this is why it's very different from the two dimensional version where if we plot the energy, it goes from zero and then climbs a very big hill because the number of errors um, generated in the process can be very, very big as the middle region grows. And it can be on the scale of the length of the linear length of the system and which is L. And because of that, uh, we say that there is an extensive energy barrier so it takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort in order to, to go across this extensive energy barrier. And because of that- Jay, Jay can I uh, interrupt with a, a short question? This came in the, in the Q&A and I think maybe it will help people to understand. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so Franklin uh, asks, uh, I, I think he's speaking about the uh, about a slide or, or so ago. Uh, why won't the neighboring magnet flip the error back and correct the error? Uh, this this picture. Uh, I'm not entirely sure. If, let, let's say the first one, indeed. Okay, so the question is, why wouldn't the, the neighboring um, why wouldn't the neighboring magnets flip and uh, correct the error? Um, I'm not exactly sure what that what the question is referring to, but let me say this. So this, this is uh, some random process. There's some random errors happening. Um, so in the first step, for example, this one's flipped, but it could just happen that it's flipped back and then the error gets corrected. And that could totally happen. And or somewhere else, another magnet gets flipped and create another pair. Um, so what I'm drawing here is uh, like a, a, a streamlined process where um, it's like uh, the arrows know what to do uh, and that they flip one and, and keep making it bigger. Uh, but of course, um, when error actually happens, it happens in a random way. But in any case, it's helpful to think about um, what the energy barrier is in the, in the streamlined process as if you know how to make the error and then go from there to talk about, for example, whether the, the domain words are making random work and, and that's how we figure out how much time it will take to flip the domain. 
Yeah, I think that's yeah. very helpful. Thank okay. you. Okay, yeah, thanks for interrupting. Right, so in two dimension, that doesn't happen because in two dimension, um, still it's uh, errors are happening randomly and uh, the magnets can get flipped. But every time you want to enlarge uh, the red region, you need to pay an energy cost. And um, at certain temperature, um, if the, 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 there's just smaller probability that you will go to higher uh, energy than to go to lower energy. And because of that, uh, because of the extensive energy barrier, um, we know that um, in, in a 2D magnets, we can store information for an exponentially long time. So, so this, this informs us why uh, quantum hard drive can be hard because compared to classical hard drive, a quantum hard drive needs to store a quantum bit and correct quantum errors. And it turns out that there are actually two types of error uh, that need to be correct, corrected. One is similar to the classical one where zero flips to one and one flips to zero. But remember that um, a quantum bit can also be in superposition. It can be, for example, in a state of zero plus one, which is different from the state of zero minus one. Um, and, and you can map between zero plus one and zero minus one, and this turns out to be the other kind of error. It's obviously different from the first type, um, and it's, it's an independent kind of quantum error. And it turns out that we, we, we need to correct just these two types of error uh, to protect a quantum bit. And the question is how to do that. Uh, well, we would need extensive energy barrier for both, if we have a quantum material, somehow we can store a quantum bit like that. And we would need extensive energy barrier for both. And we need to ask what kind of quantum state would allow us to do that. And the most straightforward way, I won't be able to explain in detail, but the, the most straightforward way to do this requires four spatial dimension. And why four? Because we need two dimension for the first type and we need two dimension for the second type. And then we put together and we need four spatial dimension. And that is uh, already known in 2001. Um, but unfortunately, we don't live in a four dimensional space. So the question is, of course, how do we lower it uh, to three dimension or lower? Is it possible at all? So the story goes that uh, back around um, 10 years ago, 2010, 2011, um, in John Preskill's group, in at Caltech, actually, um, John Presco has a quantum information group, and there was a student called Joan Ha. And Joan learned about this question of quantum hard drive from John. And, um, and what he did is to say, OK, let me do a search um, from a bunch of models that I can play with. So he went back home um, and, uh, and took out three-dimensional lattice. <laughs> And, and put some qubits on it, and then uh, try to search through a class of model and see if anything can, can do the job. Okay, so this is a, a three-dimensional cubic lattice, uh, and then put two qubits, so these dots are qubits. He put two qubits per each lattice site, and he designed super complicated interaction types. Um, to, to, to see what the model can do, okay? And it turns out, surprisingly, that one of the, one of the model seems to be, well, actually not one, but some of the models seems to be doing a much better job than the other ones. And one of, the, one of them has an interaction that, that looks like this. The interaction involves eight qubits around the cube. So of course, uh, the, the cube, a cube involves eight lattice side, and each lattice side has two qubits, so there are 16 in total. And the interaction involves half of them. And I didn't even want to write down uh, the form of the interaction because it's super complicated and not very um, illuminating. And so let me just show you this picture. Um, and uh, and Joan can show using his um, amazing mathematical skill that something weird is happening here. 
of course, this, this eight body interaction is not something that we're used to um, usually. Usually we have simple two body interactions like Coulomb attraction between positive charge and negative charge, two objects and interacting with each other or dipoles, um, they try to align or anti-align uh, again between two objects. Um, but but Joan is not deterred by that. Um, so he just went along uh, with this two, uh, eight body model. Of course, this is what we all do. We, we play with sophisticated model, toy models, we say sometimes because they're mathematically actually simpler to deal with. And then we go from there and to see if something can actually happen. Okay. So what Joan found in his code is that there's something weird happening uh, when errors are being made in, in this kind of system and, and how they propagate. Okay, so first of all, when errors are made um, in this model, it turns out they're made four at a time and they're made um, at the corner of a tetrahedron. So every time you, you make errors, uh, they sit at a corner of a tetrahedron. Of course, each of the error will correspond to uh, one of the interactions that Joan designed. And, and because of this, and because, because the errors are made using these tetrahedron structures, uh, it becomes super weird how they propagate. For example, if we do another error and, and make another tetrahedron with four errors, uh, so the, the touching point, at the touching point, the errors cancel because it's like a zero and one error. So it flips back and forth. Uh, at the touching point, they cancel, but then there are three other errors being made, right? So altogether we have six. So it looks like a bit, a bit, little bit messy until you realize that you can, well, start from one tetrahedron and then take three other copies and then put them together to get a larger tetrahedron and then what happens is that we are left with four errors again at the outer corner of this larger structure. And we can keep doing this. We can take three more copies of this structure and stack them into an even larger tetrahedron. Then we would have four errors again, one, two, three, four at the outer corners and you see that this is the process of how we make a fractal in a three-dimensional system. Right. We start from one tetrahedron, go to four tetrahedron and then make four copies of this and then stack and then we can go even further and it makes a fractal structure. So errors are being made four at a time and they spread away from each other through a fractal procedure. And that's something that we have never seen. And one very important consequence from here is that a single error cannot move because if you try to take one error and move it, the only thing you can do is to attach a tetrahedron to here. So this error cancels out, but then you're left with three more errors. So one error turns into three. That's not called a single error moving. It's called making more errors. A single error simply cannot move. And that's what we call fractal. Okay. So this is the word fractal in my title. Fractal is referring to some point error in a system that somehow cannot move. So this is one type of model uh, that Joan found. And uh, um, before and after that, people also came up with some other models with similar behavior. For example, there are these other type of model uh, where errors are made again four at a time but at a corner of a rectangle and when you try to move them you can't move one but they have to separate as the the corner of a rectangle as a set of four again if you try to move move one what you can do is to turn one into three errors but you cannot just move a single error by itself so in this case sorry in this case the fractal appears at the corner of a rectangle. Um, but what's special about this type of fractal is that if we make a pair of that, if we make a dipole of it, it starts to gain more mobility and starts to move in two-dimensional planes. 
So this is a, a side comment that I make, but it will turn out to be important for what I'm going to talk about in about maybe 10 minutes or so. Okay, so fractal dipoles moving a plane. So I'll come back to talk about it later. Okay, but, so this is all very well and you can calculate everything, but this is against all the picture we have always had in, in a condensed matter system. So this is a picture that I took uh, about uh, ideal gas, uh, gas particles bumping around with each other in a, in a box. And this is something we are taught uh, in the first class of uh, statistical mechanics. And in condensed matter, we always have this picture that uh, there are point particles and they can move and they bump into each other and that's how they transfer energy, momentum, and that's how the whole system thermalized, that's how dynamics work. And, uh, and, and, and hey, almost all, yes. So, sorry, uh, I had a request to, to reiterate, reiterate how the errors cancel in the fractal structure. Oh, um, sorry, I think maybe yes. it could be helpful for people to see that one more time. Sure. But, uh, the, the errors cancel, I didn't go into details, but the errors cancel because these are like uh, what we call Z2 errors. So it's like uh, um, um, you can, the, the error is like flipping between zero and one. So zero and one are the only two possibilities. It's either no error or one error. And if you flip, it's like you flip the magnet. If you flip the magnet, you create an error, but if you flip it back, then the error cancels. So it's in exactly the same way. So here um, uh, we do something, create an error, uh, but then we can do it again and uh, and the, the middle one just uh, because it flipped twice, flipped twice and it's a Z2 error, so it goes back. Yeah, and it's true for, for these all these cases I've been talking about. Yeah, thanks for the question. Right, so in condensed matter, we go a, a long way trying to use this picture, right? For, uh, for a system of light, we talk about photons, for systems of uh, vibration, we talk about phonons, and, and we turn everything to particles and we imagine that they, they bump into each other and, and, and thermalize. Uh, but if we now have a system where the point errors just don't move, that leads to a lot of consequences. So, this, so at this point, the problem turns from a quantum information problem of how to build a quantum hard drive into a condensed matter problem. For example, um, the system would have very unusual dynamics because the point errors don't move, so it would be very hard for them to thermalize. And, and the, the, the system just, the dynamics is totally different. And, um, and people start asking, what's the underlying physical mechanism that gives rise to these unusual dynamics? And what are the other models out there and how to even realize them? Um, and what about the notion of face and universality? And the last one is something I'm going to explain to you in detail. There's a ton of activity on this topic in the Kinesis Matter community about all these topics. And I, I could spend all my time talking about them, but I will just focus on uh, the last one. And uh, by focusing on the last one, I'll make connection to the other figure that I showed you on my title page, which is this uh, a mountain made of um, layers of deposits. Okay, so, so phase and universality, of course, is, is a fundamental notion in condensed matter. Um, and, for example, we are all familiar with, of, with the, the idea of water being in different phases. It can be a solid, it can be liquid or gas. Uh, and um, of course, we know that the difference between solid versus liquid and gas is that the solid water actually has a crystal structure, right? Has, sorry, it has crystal order. Right, like this uh, hexagonal structure of a snowflake. Uh, while in liquid and gas, there's no particular kind of order. 
all the particles are just randomly moving and uniform and isotropic. And indeed, there's actually no essential difference between liquid and water because we know above a certain temperature and above certain uh, pressure, uh, liquid and water just become the same thing. Although at, at room temperature and uh, room pressure, uh, there's a difference between them. Okay. So if we want to talk about the essential difference between different phases of water, we're actually focusing on the existence of crystal structure in solid versus the non-existence of crystal structure in liquid and gas. But at the same time, we're ignoring a lot of other details. For example, we're ignoring the exact pressure, the exact density, and the exact temperature of the system. So within a phase, within a phase, if we move around in the phase diagram, this exact pressure density and temperature will change, but they change smoothly and um, nothing dramatic happens. So we consider all these points to be within the same phase. Well, if you suddenly jump from one region without crystal order to a region with crystal order, we consider them to be different phase. And that is the notion of universality in condensed matter. And that's like the, the most basic uh, idea in condensed matter. Of course, um, this phase and universality can come in um, many different forms related to the hard drive that I talk about at the beginning of the talk, we can have magnetic order, right? In a ferromagnet, um, the magnetic order is describing the case where all the magnets in a domain is pointing in the same direction. And on top of that, uh, we can have errors or defects where part, some of the magnets gets flipped and, uh, and pointing in the opposite direction. So this is very well studied people know a lot about it and, and, and that's how we can build a very good quantum hard drive. So going to uh, the quantum system, if we have a quantum system with a lot of particles, um, a large quantum system, and especially when the particles can strongly interact with each other, and then something weird happens, something exotic happens, which have capture people's imagination in the past decades, and that is called uh, topological order. So topological order is, a, is, a, is a, a very active research area in condensed matter uh, nowadays. And I, it is based on a very unusual and surprising kind of order in condensed matter system. And uh, the, the, it's so unusual that I don't even know how to put, pick a good picture for it. So I just picked this, uh, this blue water surface um, because the, the one I'm going to fo be focusing on would be like a, a two-dimensional surface, two-dimensional uh, system. So this water surface is suggestive of that. And again, it's blue, so it's mysterious. Uh, but other than that, don't read too much into the picture. That's uh, just my failure of trying to give you a visual picture of, of what topological order is. Uh, but on top of that, similarly, uh, there can be defect. For example, we can make a ripple uh, on uh, the surface of water, and it turns out these defects can be highly unusual. So I won't try to explain to you what topological order is and, and what, uh, what, where they come from, but I can tell you a little bit about what they can do. And I want to take this detour of talking a little bit about topological order because it turns out to be um, highly uh, relevant to the fracton physics I've, I've been talking about. And it's actually essential for our study of the fracton physics. And there's a, a high level of um, parallel similarity um, between topological and the fracton side. So, so let me spend some time uh, to talk about topological order and in particular, what we now understand we can do with this topological order system. Okay, and what we can do uh, is called, uh, is that uh, we can use topological models to do quantum computation. At least theoretically, we understand it very well and experimentally, a lot of groups are making progress. 
um, towards it. So, so the idea is, of course, um, proposed by uh, Alexei Kitayev in 1997. And uh, Alexei said that um, uh, to do quantum computation, there is a way to do it um, that's more reliable, inherently more reliable and more robust than some of the other ways. And this is to take a quantum system, this two-dimensional uh, water surface that I showed you, uh, with special kind of topological order. And what do we do with it? Well, we make ripples. We make these local ripples on top of the surface, making top these defects in, uh, in this topological system. And it turns out that these are not just usual defects, they're highly complicated in particular there's hidden structure to these defects so that we can actually encode quantum bits, qubits, quantum information inside the hidden structure uh, of these defects, okay? And then, uh, and then once these qubits are encoded uh, in these defects, how computation can be done is by moving them around. So this picture is showing you that uh, you tie some string um, to these defects, and then you braid them around and, and, and make them and move them around by um, moving these strings into a braid. And by just moving them around, we'll be able to um, we'll be able to do quantum computation on the encoded qubits uh, inside the hidden structure of the defects. Okay, so these are the computation operations. For example, you can do addition, multiplication, subtraction all by moving these defects around each other. Oh, and uh, of course, all the quantum operations, not just the classical operation, but all the quantum operation as well. So this is supposed to be a more robust way of doing computation because moving one thing around each other is a, is a, a very robust process because it doesn't care about how you move around it. The exact trajectory doesn't matter as long as you move one round or two rounds. As long as the, the number of rounds is correct, then you're implementing uh, the correct operation. Okay. So, so this is, of course, uh, one of the um, proposal for uh, how to realize quantum computation. Uh, it's not a, a model that's pursued by um, all the companies, but some of them are pursuing it. For example, Microsoft are actively pursuing this topological path to quantum computation. Uh, and, um, and, um, and, 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 top, and this is because that we have a very good understanding of these topological phases. So if you learn about topological phases in, let's say, a condensed matter or maybe quantum information class, um, it can start from a version like what I was talking about for fractals. It can start from toy models. And in particular, this toy model I'm showing you has like a four body interaction. Um, again, not very realistic. Um, how, how do you make four things to interact together? But that's okay. That's just the toy model starting point uh, of our, um, of our um, study. Uh, but then starting from these toy models, we understand that it is characterizing a whole topological phase. Because we're seeing the whole topological phase, we don't just have toy models. We also have more realistic models, for example, models with two body uh, dipole uh, interaction. And we can actually have real material. Of course, people are still working very hard on that to see if we do see um, 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 reliable signal of topological phase in real materials, but at least we can do experiment on, for example, this, this, this bluish crystal, uh, which is supposed to uh, contain a uh, Kagome lattice of dipoles and dipoles interact with each other. And we can talk about whether this real material actually contains the topological property that we want in order to do quantum computation. Okay? And that's because for everything that's included in this phase, in this box, which we call, which I call a face, I understand the important universal properties. 
And this is just like we understand that for water, the important property is the existence of crystal order. And for topological order, the important properties are, for example, uh, what type of defects you can have um, on top of the order and what kind of qubits can be encoded and what kind of operation can be applied when you move them around. Okay, and that's why Microsoft would invest all this money in, the, uh, in, in, this, in this direction. If we only have toy models uh, without a connection to real material, uh, then I don't think anyone would take this um, very seriously. So this is to be contrasted with the situation of fractal. Now, all I have been telling you about fractal is about toy models. Okay, remember that I showed you this eight-body interaction uh, with a fractal structure, and later there's this, this um, uh, rectangular structure, uh, but these are all toy models. Um, and our goal, of course, is to move to the step where we can have more realistic models or even real materials, right? If, if not a, a natural crystal like this, maybe we can have metamaterials where in a cold atom system, we can imagine we trap some atoms and make them do things as we wish uh, and, and come up with some real system uh, that will actually realize what we see in the toy model. But what do we want to see in the real material that's mimicking the toy model? Because they're going to be different. They're not going to be the same model. We're never going to have an A-body interaction uh, being realized. Well, I shouldn't say never, but maybe, maybe very, very hard uh, to have an A-body interaction induced in, uh, uh, in these real systems. So if, when we try to talk about realizing this toy model in um, the lab, what are we actually looking for? What is the universal important property that we're looking for? Or put it another way, how do we want to characterize a face, a fractal face? Okay. And then we run into some immediate difficulty because if we try to address the question like we did in topological phase where we start by identifying, identifying the type of defects and try to talk about what they do, um, it seems like we, we, we have trouble because in this kind of system, the defects, they don't move, right? Individually, they don't move. And when individually they don't move, it looks like that defects are different points or different defects because you can't just take a defect and move it into another defect. So if we try to characterize a phase, I somehow have to say that, oh, there are infinite type of defects. And if I have one model compared to the other model, both of them have infinite type of defects. And how do I compare infinity with infinity? I don't know. They're both infinities. And this is to be contrasted with uh, what happens in a topological model, because in topological model, the defects move. Right? Uh, we make a ripple. And then we can touch a string to it, and then we can drag it uh, and move it around. And, and when they move around, we can talk about the defects at different locations being equivalent to each other. And that's how we can count a finite number of types for these defects. But that we cannot do for fractal system just because the defects, the errors, don't move. And when they don't move, we lose the ability of relating them, and then we end up with an infinite different species of, of defects. And that's why uh, we came up with this idea of so-called uh, foliated fractal phase. And let me explain where, where the word foliate comes from and, and how it plays a role here. So remember one thing I mentioned, and I, I, I mentioned that I will talk about it again later, and that is the fact that if I take a pair of these fractals, a pair of them, at least in some models, when I take a pair of them, they start to move. They start to move uh, in a two-dimensional plane. So this pair, for example, will move in the plane that's perpendicular to, to the line that's connecting them. 
And that is very useful because, because now we can say that, well, if when we connect them, they start to move, then we can talk about equivalence of, the, of this fractal and that fractal up to something that moves in a, in a two-dimensional plane. Right. If we imagine a situation where we can just add these two-dimensional dipoles or remove them for free, we can imagine that uh, we somehow have the ability of consider them as something for free. Then we can relate. Oops. Then we can relate this fractal to the other fractal because we can just add a, a dipole to one of them and turn it into the other, and, and vice versa. And similarly, I can go this way because there will be another dipole that goes in um, this horizontal direction that moves in a perpendicular plane and uh, the third direction. And because of that, up to these dipoles, my fracton can move. If I imagine a situation where I can get dipoles for free, my fractons can move and my fractons are not isolated at a point and I can relate fracton defects at different points, and then I can count a finite species of fractons. And the finite number is something I can deal with, not infinity. Okay. So what it helps me to do is to actually reduce the species of fracton, uh, of fracton defects from infinity to just one, at least for, for, for some of the models, uh, to just one or two. And not some meaningful number I can compare between one model and another. But how can I how can I just imagine that these 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 fractal dipoles shows up for free? They are highly non-trivial, right? They they are they move in a two-dimensional plane. Where do they come from? Well, it turns out that for these fractal models, some probably some of them they have hidden structures. And the hidden structure is, can be revealed by doing some smooth connection, smooth deformation of the system. It's like changing uh, the pressure and the temperature in water, just do some smooth deformation of the system. And it turns out that when we do that, a layer will decouple out of the system. And this layer is the topological layer that I told you about. It's this mysterious blue, Waterish um, two-dimensional layer uh, that I showed you like earlier, and of course this dipole that moves in a two-dimensional plane are the defects, are the ripple defects uh, in this in this decoupled topological plane. So so we can do smooth deformation to decouple one layer. We can do smooth deformation to decouple another layer. And eventually, we can identify a bunch of layers in the system. And that's why I, I showed you this picture of a, of, a, of a rock, of a big, huge rock or a mountain with these layers of deposits. And this is what's called a foliation structure. That is, if you have a three-dimensional chunk of material or a rock, and then it has two-dimensional layer structure and that is called uh, foliation. So it turns out that in some of these fractal models, we also have foliation structure. But if, if the three-dimensional book is made out of two-dimensional layers, especially if it's made out of two-dimensional topological layer, which we're already familiar with and spent decades studying them, then it sounds like not that exciting. And it sounds like something that we can imagine that we want to consider them being adding, added or removed for free. And this is what motivated us to to consider this totally new definition of face. And it, it's, it's, it's a jump from original definition where people just say, okay, you can change uh, the temperature and the, the uh, you can change the temperature and the pressure of the system or some coupling constant in the system and smoothly deform it. And we are taking that and added on top this extra structure of saying, Okay, let me also add layers. 
Because if everything's coming from layers which are know about and which people have made a lot of progress about, then I don't care about them because it looks like there's something beyond layers going on here. Now, the fact that there are fractals is something that's not possible with just layers, and I want to capture that. And being able to consider these layers for free will help me with it. And that's exactly because that allows me to identify what is some of the all important properties, for example, everything that comes with hidden layers, like the, 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 the defects that move in a plane, that comes with a layer, right? And if that comes with hidden layers, I consider it to be not important. And if that's not important, I can talk about the relation between my fractons up to these dipoles, and that allows me to actually count a finite number of species of these fracton defects, and that is something that's intrinsically 3D. That's not just because of hidden two-dimensional layers. Okay, so this is becoming a little bit technical and complicated. So let me try to give you an analogy uh, using picture and mosaic picture. Um, so here are two pictures of dogs, They're very cute, but otherwise very different, uh, different puppies. Um, so when we look at these two pictures, we will say, oh, they're different dogs. Uh, but when we use these pictures of dogs to make a mosaic picture of a dog, we can use different components. For example, I can use the white one on the left-hand side and the yellow one on the right-hand side. But on the whole, if I'm looking at a mosaic picture, I will say, oh, these two are the same dog. Although if you look more into the detail, you will say each component picture might be a different dog, right? And I think that that's an analogy that I tried to come up with to explain to you this difference between the foliated fracton face we're trying to define and the usual sense of face uh, that people are talking about. We're somehow in a sense trying to define a face up to a lower order of feature that usually people care about. Usually we would care about the difference between this puppy and this puppy, but once we make it into a mosaic picture, we want to ignore that because we want to talk about a higher level uh, of similarity. And, uh, and it turns out to be something also uh, useful to have because once we have that definition, it allows us to, to do something. For example, there are there are these models I don't want to tell you about all the details, but they look very different. For example, one is a spin model, the other is a fermionic model, and one has its degrees of freedom on edge, the other has it on vertices, and blah, blah, blah. One has a four-fold rotation symmetry, the other only has two-fold rotation symmetry, and they look very different. But once we have this more general, <clears throat> more general notion of a face, we actually see that they are the same mosaic picture of dog. And, um, and, and, and we were able to um, take a bunch of models like this and actually identify relations among them and divide the whole thing into phase, what we call a phase diagram. It's like, this is the solid phase, this is the water and gas phase, and this is, I don't know, maybe superfluid phase or something. And we actually identify some new phase. Uh, that, uh, that we didn't know before. So, so back to this picture, uh, where we are, uh, we're at this very minor step of relating one toy model to another toy model. And so this is some progress. Of course, we still need to uh, answer the question of how do we get more realistic models or even how to go to real materials. Um, so these are, of course, um, all the important questions that needs to be addressed. But as I promised you, instead of taking you down this more realistic path, I will take you even further uh, down the unrealistic path of telling you about the third connection that this study of fractal model have taken us to uh, in terms of connection to quantum field theory. Okay, so I started about talking about uh, how it started as a quantum information problem, how it evolved into a condensed matter problem. 
Uh, but then uh, it turned out to be an interesting question for quantum field theory as well. And the question is how to describe this fractal order and its defect using quantum field theory. So quantum field theory, of course, this is another field uh, in uh, theoretical physics. It's actually a very useful language that we use it in, in many different fields. Uh, in theoretical physics, we can, and there are lots of textbooks on it, so you know that it's very well developed and it can, it, it, it's underlying some of the most amazing development of physics in the 20th century. Uh, for example, describing particles colliding with each other in the Large Hadron Collider and predicting to very high accuracy uh, what can happen in there and predicting particles, the Higgs particle uh, that, uh, that paper, people later uh, discovered. And, uh, and then it underlies uh, string theory, uh, which is uh, another very important branch uh, in theoretical physics. And of course, it plays a very important role uh, in condensed matter as well in terms of describing phase and phase transitions. Okay, so it has already had a lot of success. And um, for example, for the magnetic order that I talked about a while ago, underlying the, the classical hard drive, uh, for the magnetic order, uh, the, the idea of quantum field theory is to say, okay, in, in, instead of looking at individual magnets, let me zoom out and then take off my eyeglasses and uh, everything will turn into a blur such that I see everything smoothed out. And I'll take the average magnetization of a region and consider this continuum material to be described by the magnetization field, which is to say the magnetization changes from point to point and maybe change from time to time. And, and it's a continuous function of space and time and, uh, and, and the dynamics of the system or how the defects can happen and can evolve is described by some, some function of this field, right? So this is, a, this is a field of space and time and then we put them into a big function, which we call Lagrangian. I won't explain what that is, but that will somehow give us all the important information about uh, the dynamics of the system, how phase transition happens, uh, etc. On the other hand, of course, um, field theory has been, quantum field theory has been very successful in describing topological order as well. So this mysterious blue water surface, and it turns out for many of them, uh, the, the, the important field is what is called a gauge field. Again, uh, we're talking about some continuous function of space and time and, uh, and the defects, uh, how they are made, how they move, how their dyna dynamics are like, are described like, uh, by a Lagrangian in terms of these gauge fields. And we understand, for example, what happens when one moves around the other and what kind of qubits can be encoded and what kind of uh, uh, operation can be applied. And it turns out that Fractal represents a challenge to this very well-developed theoretical tool of, of quantum physics because um, it's not very well understood how to go from what we, whatever we know about fractal model to a continuum field theory. And there are a lot of developments, but it's just the beginning and we're seeing a lot of activities, a lot of very exciting activities. And there are a lot of questions to be addressed as well. For example, um, how to take a discrete lattice model like this and, and then, then somehow zoom out and think of it as a continuous field. Um, how do we somehow take the average and, and, um, and get a, a more continuous picture of fractal field to describe what's happening here? And, um, and of course, if we get a fractal field, we hope that we would be able to describe uh, the exotic thing that can happen to the defects. For example, they, they move away from each other according to this fractal structure. That sounds like highly discrete and relying on a lattice structure. How do we do that? Do we, how do we have a continuum description of it? And, uh, and more than that, 
how do we capture this notion of fractal order up to some lower level orders? Right. The quantum field theory for the other orders, magnetic order, topological order, they are very well established to, to capture the order in those phases. But for the fractal one, we're capturing in a sense an order up to lower order. So how does that work? Uh, I think that's, uh, that's another challenge. So of course, so this is how um, um, we started from this quantum information question of building a hard drive and how it inspired um, people in commence matter to do a lot of things. And among them, uh, we were considering this idea a notion of phase and universality and make connection to this foliation structure. And finally, um, I told you about uh, a lot of activities on the field theory side of how people try to develop a field theory description uh, of these models. And, and in that way, extending field theory to a new regime. Of course, this is one of the topic of what we consider as ultra, ultra quantum matter. Uh, where a lot of quantum mechanical particles strongly interact with each other and giving rise to new kinds of phenomena. And this is of course a, a collaborative effort and not just me, but uh, many other people in the collaboration also working on it. Michael Levin at Chicago, uh, John McGreevy at UCSD, Mike Hermely at uh, Boulder and uh, Nighty Seiberg at IES. So, at this point, you might ask me, are we gonna build a quantum hard drive at all <laughs> after all this? Well, the answer is, the shorter answer is uh, not, not quite yet. Um, it, uh, it, we still don't have a very good theoretical proposal, even though even theoretical proposal for how to build a quantum hard drive uh, in three spatial dimensions. So that is still, a very much open question. Um, but as you can see, we, I, I don't care. And uh, we'll just follow the topic and see wherever it leads us down the rabbit hole. So thank you. <laughs>